Morning Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution, Facebook comrades and friends, and those of you on YouTube who will see it about a half hour later. So good morning to you too. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. The, uh, morning, Revolution. Uh, Scott, and I almost called you something else. <laughs> there you go. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Michael, you were hanging out with the Venezuelans last night. How was it? Yeah, that's right. The Venezuelan foreign minister was in town, or he's, I guess he's still in town for the United Nations General Assembly. And we had a little uh, meeting with him and other left wing and radical activists from around the country that came in from DC, um, uh, California and so forth. And it was a really good meeting. Um, the last time I was in Venezuela was two years ago, right before the, the um, attempted coup, which failed. And, you know, we were all reassured that everything's fine. Things are getting better there. Um, they have the pandemic more or less under control. They're getting a lot of support from Cuba, the Cuban doctors. And uh, they reiterated time and time again for us to go back out into the, into the world and into the masses of American workers and remind them that Venezuela is not the enemy. Venezuela is not the enemy. They don't want war. They don't want to tell us how what to do with our government or how to run our elections. They just want peace. They want to be left alone. And so, you know, we as the Communist Party, we as American workers, we really have to go out there and, and spread the truth to avoid another uh, Cold War against, um, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, China, and so forth. Good points, good points. Well, uh, speaking of things south of the border, actually, this is a little bit north of the border. There's an imperialist crisis on the border, well, it has been for some time. And this time, it involved Haitians, refugees who fled Haiti 10 years ago, and some of them were uh, in Latin America, Brazil, working on the Olympics. Some of them were in Chile and other countries. And there were 15,000 camped under a bridge, and there are more who were traveling up through Central America to the U.S. border, Rosanna. And you know what I read this morning? That the Biden administration has appointed some uh, yokel to look into setting up a new refugee camp at Gitmo in Cuba. And they're looking for people who speak Creole so that they can talk to the Haitians. Oh what do you think God. about that? <laughs> That's horrifying. Horrifying. It? This... If it's true. <laughs> well, just to see the scene, I mean, you know, the, the border patrol on horseback is just shameful. We in the United States should be shamed, you know, should feel all that shame and not allow this kind of stuff to happen. It's just shameful to, to treat people like that. We should know better. It's just disgusting. disgusting. And we, you know, we yep. caused all of this. We call all, we caused all this migration, just like we did in Afghanistan. We caused it throughout the world. So we have a responsibility to the to the community, to the Haitian community, and all those that are coming. We have a responsibility to help. And, and provide the, what they're seeking is just a job, food, and shelter. They're not seeking anything else but that. And, and, and you know, uh, the, uh, one of the tragedies of it all was that them boys on horseback with the whips, they're the same people, Scott, that Trump shipped up to Portland during the George Floyd protest, mm. you know? A bunch of okay. fascist thugs. You can and you can see the the just the clear line between all the manifestations of white supremacy, whether it's you know the crackdown on Black Lives Matter or the the barbaric uh, actions at the border, um, and you can't you can't wall out the consequences of of imperialism. Rosanna is a, is absolutely right. Um, the United States is the primary cause of all of the, the disruptions, um, both uh, environmental, ecological, political, um, economic, that cause these waves of mass migration. And then, you know, we somehow, or I should say not we, but the, the US ruling class somehow thinks it can, you know, draw a line at the border and say, you know, this far and no farther, you can't come here. We, we don't have to deal with 
you know, with the consequences of of what we caused. It's um, it's horrifying. Whether you're you know building a wall or or riding people down on horseback or putting them in concentration camps or or um, shipping them off to the um, illegal prison that you know we hold um, on the the territory of Cuba. Uh, it, it's it's insane and it, it has to end. I agree with everything you just said, Scott, except for the use of the royal we. I ain't got no base in Gitmo and I didn't have nothing, nothing to do with the Biden and Trump and Obama and all of those Johnson and Nixon, Carter, Bush policies, Anita, but Obama, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, the Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, Biden speech at the uh -huh. UN. Did you listen to it? I listened to it this morning. Uh, wasn't in, a bad in its entirety. It was. Wasn't I mean, a bad speech. it wasn't a bad speech. It wasn't a very sincere or or uh, uncynical speech. Uh, um, he had some very um, lofty ideas and some really sinister ideas in there too, and also some some elements in there that really are designed to confuse people. And that I think was the thing that really irritated me the most was this um, uh, confusion around the word democracy. And it just seems to me, uh, he, he, they, he, Biden talks about um, uh, democratic countries, but really he's talking about capitalist countries and not, not countries where d small d democracy, where people really get what they want if we had a democracy in the United States, people would have what they wanted and they want, you know, access to free and safe, I mean, safe, uh, free healthcare, safe abortion, um, you know, uh, free community college. We want all those things um, and yet we don't have them. Um, so how is this a, a, a rule by the people? Um, we want I, freedom of speech too, which we don't have because all of the speeches taken up by the big corporate monopolies who dominate the uh, a, a discourse. So it wasn't a bad speech, but it wasn't a great speech either. But Michael, don't you think that he was kind of backing up from the Cold War posture? After all, he said, I am not in favor of a Cold War. And then he's repeated it. I am yeah, not in favor of a Cold War. You know, I, 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 when, when he said that, I thought, I wonder if he read Joe's article, Joe Sims' article. <laughs> right. No, but really, I, I thought it was interesting. The first, you know, half of his speech, he talked about um, getting back in the, the Paris Climate Accords. And I, I listened to, I, I was, I had a lot of free time this week as I was working and I was listening to, uh, I think, probably 11 hours of, of the UN General Assembly. So Biden's speech, the Iranian president, the French you know, rep representatives, and everyone pretty, men pretty much mentioned um, climate change. And so I think that was good. We, when we analyze Biden's speech, we can say, all right, that's fine. But when he mentions the Cold War, as you said, he mentioned it twice that he didn't want a Cold War, then he went into but, but this, but that. And it was really shameful that I think um, his speech was uh, right after the Iranian president's speech. And the Iranian, he did a virtual video and he said something like, um, nuclear weapons don't belong in uh, governments anymore. You know, now we have to look at disarming. And, you know, Biden, I'm sure he didn't watch that video. He went into saying, but we're going to face threats like Iran. He, you know, mentioned it by name and, and China and so forth, you know, head on. But, but we don't want a Cold War. And so, you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it, it is a duck, right? And so I think that um, maybe their understanding of what a Cold War is, is different than, than, you know, our understanding of what a Cold War is. I know most people probably didn't think when Trump was ramping up the, the trade war with China, they didn't think that was like preparing for a Cold War, but it was. Um, but we all remember Biden and, and Trump's uh, presidential debates when it was like a, a, a competition of who could be more anti-China. And so the fact that he had to say, but, and then explain, you know, who our quote unquote enemies are um, and, you know, tell them to watch their back and not step out of line after saying, oh, but I don't want a cold war. I think that's a, it's a big warning sign. But, you know, really, what the hell do you expect? I mean, is it really Rosanna Biden and the government's fault? I mean, isn't there, you know, it seems to me like this is very similar to what happened in 2009, right? 
Obama got elected, big mass movement. Everybody was, and then on the ground, silence. No push from below, except from the right, there was a Tea Party. And then a little bit later, or maybe a little bit before, I shouldn't say no push, there was Occupy, but there was no push from uh, the union, women, uh, African-American, immigrant rights, I shouldn't say immigrants rights because I really don't know, to push the Obama administration to implement the many proposals that they had put on the ground. And are we dealing with a similar situation now where there's like a crisis of inaction? Well, I don't, I'm, I don't know for sure, just yet. I see people on the street. I, you know, not um, that I see the fight back. The Poor People's Campaign is waging a huge uh, campaign to end poverty and are meeting with legislators and putting the pressure. Um, and there are others. The Women's uh, March is happening on October 3rd. Uh, we'll see how big that is. I think that'll help, help us to understand whether. There's that movement, the continuous movement. You know, I always think about what Obama said when he was elected or before that. He said, I'm not, I'm not the change you're looking for, I'm the opportunity. And had we taken that opportunity and pushed, and you know, the people's movement have pushed, continued to push, you know, we would have had uh, more things now than we did, you know, he would have been able to do more than than he was, especially with the right saying he was gonna, um, they were gonna fight him every step of the way. So I think that has to be a lesson for us is that it's still up to us as a movement, as a people, as a working class to make, to bring about the change that we wanna see. But it means we've, we've, gotta get out, we've gotta get out there in the streets, call our congressmen, legislators, all of, all of those kinds of things that show, that, that resonate, you know, that. Uh, voice our thinking and our opposition and all of that kind of a thing. So you got to get on the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got you got to get on the bus, Anita. Because I got on the oh, bus. Sure. Uh, on that point. Hold up, uh, I got on the bus and I, uh, on the train to DC, and um, Anita, and I was on my. I got down there to the voting rights march, and. You know, it was a few thousand people there, but there should have been 10,000 for every bill that the right wing has put in the state legislatures to suppress the vote, right? Yes, yes, there should be, but there aren't because people are work, still working numerous jobs to keep uh, their families together and food on the table. And they're afraid of um, pandemic uh, uh, still is, is raging in, in most places. So I think people are kind of reluctant to get out there. But I, I see what Rosanna sees. I see people calling and, 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 uh, and you know, going after their, uh, their re representatives. I think there is at least, I'm speaking for Ohio here, there is some feeling of futility because our um, our congressional representatives are so locked into their positions and their, their um, districts are so gerrymandered as to lock in their future electoral success too. So it, it seems like that is exacerbating our feelings of uh, uh, in, inefficacy. We can't, we can't, we, we, people I think feel that they, they can't make a difference right now. They're mistaken. They could make a difference in in numbers enough. And I think I, I agree that the women's march on October second is going to be a really good opportunity to bring up a lot of these issues. A lot of the Build Back Better um, uh, package is is aimed at at making women's lives better. And uh, and I think we have to get out there and fight for reproductive rights as well. So I think it's a big issue. It'll be a big uh, march this year. Scott. God? Sorry, yeah. Um, so I think we have to remember, like, think of what Anita just said. We're in a, a difficult time for people to get out. In 2009 as well, we were at the, the depth of the worst economic crisis that most 
living people and certainly all living, you know, employed people or recently unemployed people had ever seen. Um, uh, and unions labor was dealing also with, you know, with that. So, but I, I think there are kind of two narratives about this. I like the term crisis of inaction. Um, uh, so one narrative um, is uh, it's because, you know, we have a democratic administration that's making all kinds of promises. So people get lulled into a false sense of security and they sit back and whatever. So that's, I think, a very usual one that I, that I hear, but I don't think, I don't think that's really accurate. I don't think it captures all of it. I think it, the other side is that um, the tradition of doing politics around elections is really strongly rooted here. Like election year is like the high point of the political cycle because that's where the work has traditionally happened. I'm gonna say electoral rut and I say rut not in a totally negative sense, but it's like a, a, a worn in pattern, right? That's kind of how we do it. What we saw in 2016 or rather 2020 was um, a, a really enormous attempt to kind of change that pattern, to, to do elections differently, to make them much more uh, militant, much more issue focused, much more um, uh, sort of to a uh, mass electoral mobilization, I think you called it, right? So we're, we're, we're making progress there, but we also need to develop new patterns in the off time, right? It just, it hasn't caught on yet. We don't have a, a rod or a track or a pattern uh, for maintaining you know, a sustained pressure um, on the administration in, except around elections. And we've got to change that. I kind of want to push back though, a little bit on that, just because I agree last was a, was an election year, you know, 2020, but I think that the, the George Floyd uprising was, was separate. I think that would have happened, you know, that huge uprising would have happened no matter what, had it been an election year or not. And so my hope is, is that with, um, you know, this kind of onset of a new Cold War, uh, the sanctions continuing on Cuba, Venezuela, um, you know, the climate crisis, uh, my hope is that, as Rosanna was saying, people become more active. And there is more than like 2,000 people showing up to a voting rights rally in, in the Women's March in certain cities on October 2nd. And that this uprising, that same uh, fervor, that same uh, like motivation and inspiration that we felt, you know, uh, summer of last year is seen, you know, going, going forward. We have to, it has to be that and much more um, if we're gonna get any work done. And so I, I have faith that it can happen. I don't think it has to be an election year, but I think that people have to understand uh, what's at stake. And so, you know, I understand that the pandemic's the problem, but more people are vaccinated. What, you know, this summer of last year when the George Floyd riots uh, and, and um, protests were taking place, that no one was vaccinated yet. And so, you know, I don't really think there's a, a huge excuse for it now. I think people can get involved any way possible. I'm, I'm for people making phone calls and whatever, but now's the time to get out in the streets. You know, the weather's still nice. And so um, I, I think we have to really, as the Communist Party, we have to push for that um, and push for, you know, the, this independent role of, of, the, of the masses um, to get out there and, and, and take their place. Very important idea there, uh, uh, Michael. The, the well, Emails are not enough. They're good. Phone calls, better. Calls better. They don't like it when you jam up the phone system. Text messaging, okay. But you need to physically get out there. And I, 200 Haitians in Little Miami, Rosanna, got out on the street the other day and blocked the highway. I hope they had allies in the uh, Black, Latin, white community, Asian. You know, you ain't out there by yourself. This is not, we all have to fight together to make change happen. And it can't be politics as usual because the right wing is mobilizing, y'all. I mean, they're mobilizing big time. And uh, we got to get out there with them. I agree. I, I was just thinking right now while others were talking about the turnout here in California on the recall. That was really unexpected. You know, it was almost a two to one. People uh, actually voted either uh, 
um, by mail or went to the polls. So that's, you know, that's hopefully it's a sentiment that is felt throughout the country. When the people are needed, they'll get out there. But we we'll, I think we still can't say for sure. All right. Now, time for our lightning round. Um, first, we got these bills in Congress, three five point five trillion. Is it going to pass? Yes or no, Rosanna? Oh my God! <laughs> Can we have that third option? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, once again, I think it's the people. You know, we've got to push. We've got to pressure. My congressman had a whole town hall yesterday via Zoom, and you can find it on uh, YouTube, Jimmy Gomez. So uh, on the on exactly this. So um, and you know, he didn't have it because he wanted to. He did it because people pressured in, him into it. So I think, you know, it's up to us. It's really up to us. We've got to get out there. We can do it. Scott, yes or no? Bill's going to pass. Uh, I was going to ask if um, I haven't over the past week or so followed the, the current status of, you know, what, what bills there are um, between the original 3.5 trillion, the reconciliation program, the counter offer from the the moderates. Um, so, um, could you, could or somebody maybe uh, refresh me on uh, what the the different packages are, and then I'll give my prognosis after the class is over. I mean, the discussion. <laughs> we only got a couple of minutes left. Anita, yes or no? I would say yes. It's going to pass. I'm not sure it will be looking exactly like it is, but we'll learn a lot more about everybody involved. Um, at the end of it. And I think they're going to be able to get to a yes by um, uh, making sure that it's paid for with different different ways of paying, uh, whether taxing uh, the rich or um, some other, you know, closing tax loopholes. I think they will get to the money. I think it's going to be hard for Joe Manchin to say, uh, no, I don't want the climate change aspect aspects of the Build Back Better plan. I don't, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard for anybody to take responsibility for nixing any part of that bill because people want the whole thing. Uh, and I think- Oh, so it's a yes. It's a yes. yes, it's a yes. <laughs> okay. And Michael, yes or no? I'm going to say yes, just because I, I read yesterday that um, a record was broken in Congress in terms of how many- um, uh, elective, elected officials voted ag against, um, uh, or I guess they voted in favor of cutting the military budget. It didn't pass, the amendment didn't pass, but it was a record number of Democrats. And so it certainly should pass. And if it doesn't pass, as Rosanna said, the people's movements know uh, who to hold accountable because the Democrats hold Congress and the White House. So, All right, we got one minute left. It's a yes. Uh, <clears throat> I agree. Yes. Now, next. Speaking of this bill, Ilhan Omar yesterday tweeted, and this is, I agree or disagree, and there's no speeches afterwards. <laughs> Democrats, I'm quoting her now, Democrats across the political spectrum threatening to sink our own bill does nothing but hurt us, constituents and our majority in Congress and our majority. Rosanna, agree or disagree? Yes. Yes, agree. Scott, agree or disagree? Present. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Oh, I'm, I'm, with, uh, I'm with uh, Ilan Omar and, and Rosanna on this one. Anita. Strongly agree. Strongly agree. Michael. Agree. I am not a Democrat, so I really can't speak on it. <laughs> No, I think they seem makes it good. On the other hand, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta balance. Uh, you gotta take a position. No speeches <laughs> afterward. No speeches afterward. You said <laughs> uh, that does it. <laughs> Strong. Stay safe. Stay in the fight. And Michael, we got a webinar on Sunday. Uh, the twenty sixth. Yes, there's a webinar on uh, China and uh, from the revolution in nineteen forty nine all the way to eliminating poverty in 2021. So you can get on cpusa.org and register to attend that event. I believe it's taking place at um, 7 p.m. Eastern, perhaps 8, 8 p.m. So register to attend that and we'll see you there. 
Be there, be square. Have a great weekend, everybody, and a great week. Talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Later, comrades. <laughs>